Focus features a production company that is owned by NBC Universal and Comcast. Their latest film, The American Society of Magical Negroes, has bombed at the box office. Before we get into this, I'd like to ask you, please hit that subscribe button, hit that bell for notifications so you don't miss any of our future videos here at The Trent Report. I wrote this up over at thatparkplace.com this morning. The film, which is directed by Kobe Libby and stars actor Justice Smith, only grossed $1.25 million in its debut weekend. That is according to the numbers. The numbers also reports it was only screened in 1,147 theaters. Its per theater gross was a meager $1,090. Interestingly enough, uh, there were no long-range box office predictions for this film. Mainly probably because the pre-sales for this film were so abysmally low that are now reflected in this entire box office weekend of just 1.25 million. I mean, I was looking over the past month on Box Office Pro, and they did not have any kind of box office predictions for this film for an enti- for the entire month leading up to it. Uh, not only do we not see any box office predictions, but we don't actually know what the production budget of this film is either. I haven't seen that anywhere listed anywhere so it's likely that this film lost hundreds of millions of dollars maybe not hundreds of millions of dollars but probably tens of millions of dollars uh given the fact that it's likely not going to make anywhere uh it probably is not going to even get anywhere close to 10 million in its entire box office run absolutely got torched at the box office not only did it get torched at the box office but it was getting panned by both critics and moviegoers uh on a number of review sites if you look at rotten tomatoes 30 percent on the tomato meter score from critics it received an average rating of five out of ten with just 15 fresh reviews and 35 rotten reviews. If you look over at the top critics score, that's even worse. It's a 19% rotten rating. The average rating from top critics was a 4.7 out of 10 with just three fresh reviews and 13 rotten reviews on the audience side. Uh, it looks like there's only there's less than a hundred reviews total from moviegoers, which just shows you that no one went to see this film. You can see there it just says 50 plus verified reviews there on that screenshot. Uh, but the um Verified audience score sits at 65%. As you can see, the average rating is a 3.5 out of 5. The all audience score sits at 28%, a rotten 28%. And that has an average rating of 1.9 out of 5. Over on Metacritic, it has a meta score of 52 from 18 critics. There are five positive reviews, 11 mixed reviews, and two negative reviews. The user score sits at a 0.5. There are only two positive reviews and 39 negative reviews. And then if you look at IMDb, which is just from moviegoers, uh, it has a current uh, IMDb uh, score of 2.7 out of 10 uh, from users with the majority being uh, one <laughs> rating the film one out of 10, uh, almost, almost <laughs> three quarters of people who saw this film or who rated this film gave it a one out of 10. You can see. The second most popular score was a 2 out of 10 with a little less than 8% giving it that. So people were not liking this, whether they were critics or moviegoers. And it's not surprising that uh, the film did as bad as it did at the box office and it got such bad reviews because the, the first trailer of this film made it very clear that the film was indeed racist. Uh, the first trailer sees Justice Smith's character Aaron, quote, feeling the discomfort of white people. A character played by David Allen Greer then says, watching you walk through a room full of white people is the most painful thing I've ever seen. At one point during the trailer, Greer's character asks, what's the most dangerous animal on the planet? And then Aaron responds, shark, because they're standing in front of a great white shark poster there at some kind of museum or an aquarium or something like that. And then Greer responds to him saying white people when they feel uncomfortable. So he's saying white people are the most dangerous animal on the planet when they feel uncomfortable. It doesn't get any more racist than that. He then goes on and explains, Greer's character explains, white people feeling uncomfortable precedes a lot of bad stuff for us. That's why we fight white discomfort every day because the happier they are, the safer we are. I mean, just reeks with racism. It's absolutely disgusting. And this is the worldview of the film's director, Kobe Libby. Uh, He made it abundantly clear in a number of interviews leading up to the film's box office bomb this past weekend that the intent of the film was to lecture people on racism and use it as a bludgeon to achieve political power. 
This is what he told NBC News. This conversation around the expectation that black people are prioritizing white comfort over our own history and our own sense of self is an incredibly contemporary problem. That's happening politically in America right now. You see these laws being passed in places like Florida around what black history is taught that are literally saying that elements of black history, things that really happened in America, cannot be said out loud in the classroom if it makes white kids uncomfortable. And then he would reiterate this in an interview with the Philadelphia Sunday Sun, uh, where he discussed his thoughts on the magical Negro trope. He says, I think the magical Negro is a stock character, a recurring character that typically white writers have employed across movies and literary history. It is a black character who only exists to support the white lead. They don't really have their own internal life. They're not really a three-dimensional person. The black best friend, the wise old man who comes in with a sprinkle of advice for the white hero just at the perfect moment. The reason that it's important as a troubling trope to me is because it quietly says black lives don't matter. It quietly says black people belong in the background and white people belong in the foreground. The hero of the story is a white person and a black person only matters as much as they're adding value to a white person's story. So uh, obviously an utterly disgusting worldview uh, that this person is espousing here that Kobe Libby is espousing and uh he, he makes it very clear that uh he says that the the whole film was an attack on what he views as a trope uh i mean i guess you can describe it as a trope i guess there's a number of films that maybe do employ this kind of thing but i'm sure there's a plethora of examples of films that also have white best friends that are treated the same way or asian best friends that are treated the same way or uh hispanic best friends or th that are treated the same way uh but it's only uh, a bad thing uh when it's a uh when it's being done to a black character apparently uh it's just utterly ridiculous and just just stupid but nevertheless, he goes on and says this. The film is an attack on this trope and also is an attack on that theme in American life. Who gets to be the center of American life? Whose lives matter and whose lives require marches, movements, and real effort to protect? That dichotomy is all there in the trope. Part of what I'm interested in writing about is how racism works now. There are so many important historical stories about slavery, segregation, and racism in America's past that sometimes centering those stories can contribute to the suggestion that it's over or that we've solved it, but we haven't solved it. It has just changed how it has been showing up. It's showing up in these insidious ways in technology and unconscious biases. I'm sure, I'm sure he's not talking about Google Gemini and their erasure of historical white characters uh, <laughs> through that uh, Google's AI generated image creator. I'm sure, I'm sure he's not talking about the Supreme Court ruling on the discrimination that universities were, were, were committing against white people and Asian people. I'm sure he's not talking about that. I'm sure he's not talking about the EEOC complaint that is being filed against the Walt Disney Company for their discrimination against uh, white people uh, in the workforce. I'm sure he's not talking about any of that, right? He couldn't be, right? He couldn't be talking about that. That's not what he's talking about. Because he makes it clear what he's talking about. He says this. It's not that there's a literal second system for black people the way that there was in the 50s, but the outcomes are still really real. Part of my job as a black filmmaker is to try to make that dif difficult to pin down insidious quality of racism tangible and visible for audiences. I actually think he made it very clear that that difficult to pin down insidious quality of racism is tangible. He just didn't do it the way he thought he was going to do it. He made it very clear that <laughs> That there is racism against white people when you have a bunch of black characters saying that the most dangerous uh, animal on the planet is white people. Uh, so you made it very clear that difficult to pin down insidious quality of racism is now tangible and visible for audiences. So you did do that. You just didn't do it the way you thought you were doing. Uh, but it is good that this film failed. The director's in intentions were obviously evil and vile and that, that this film only making 1.25 million dollars is very very good indeed it should have made even less but uh i'll take this huge win because this is a huge win that this absolutely garbage disgusting film failed and bombed at the box office but let me know what you guys make of this let me know in the comments below remember to always be charitable but to always speak the truth